Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sister to Sister. This is the show where we open hearts and we open minds simply by having conversations about what it's like to be a woman of color in today's world. And that's this world in the United States as well as around the world. And I'm so excited to have with us today the fabulous Raksha Joshi. And Raksha is uh, also here in South Florida with me. And you know, those of you who live up north don't want to hear that we're really cold here. It's in the 60s, so we're all freezing. <laughs> so isn't it funny, Raksha, how if we lived in New York or Atlanta and if it was 60 degrees, we'd been shorts. But when we're in South Florida, we think we're cold. <laughs> have a sweater on. <laughs> I know. I think it's because we have the humidity is 70% and I think that's what it is. But regardless, uh, I'm so glad that you're here today and that you're going to be spending uh, time with us a little bit sharing your info. Let me go ahead and share a little bit about you. First of all, um, I was surprised to hear that you were born in Uganda, right? Because like yeah. every white person, so I'm a white person. I know I little, look a little <laughs> black and white today on my uh, screen, but you know, you I heard your accent, and my mind immediately goes to India. Like that's where I went. Mm -hmm. I heard the I heard English, you know, the English, the UK kind of accent in there too. But born in Uganda and moved to London when you were a young girl, right? You were about eight years old. Yeah, seven, eight. Seven, eight. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. grew up really in England. And then yes. moved to the U.S. and uh, have been a U.S. citizen for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a long time. And you know what's interesting is when you moved uh, from Uganda, it you reminded me that shortly thereafter was a coup in Uganda with Idi Amin. And I remember as a young child hearing about Idi Amin and what was going on in Uganda. So I'm interested to hear how that affected you. Uh, even though you had left the country, I know you still had relatives in Uganda at that time, right? My father and my sister were still there. Yeah. And a lot of my extended family was still there. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to hear about, you know, a government coup, <laughs> an interesting thing, <laughs> right? But let me, let me tell everybody about you because you have a really varied background. You know, Raksha has, you're not going to believe this, but over three decades in the corporate world, in corporate America, and she's uh, had pivotal roles in restructuring and developing new departments for efficiency. So you know I love that because my husband calls me the efficiency expert. <laughs> I'm always looking for how can I do this faster, quicker, better. Um, she's applied those skills to build many businesses, including uh, her own, because she has overcome multiple life transitions herself, not just the ones we've just talked about moving from place to place, but she brings the experience and knowledge that she's developed to support entrepreneurs and individuals in creating successful lives through implementing customized processes that are unique for them. You know, we always talk about the systems is what makes a business work having a process that you know you can follow over and over again. And that's really what Raksha is a star at. Raksha, the rock star, that's how I think of her. Um, she's also a certified coach through the John Maxwell Group, which is, you know, that's be having that um, designation is an honor, having worked with John Maxwell himself, who many of you know is a leadership guru who's written upwards of 80 books on leadership and he's seen as the leader in leadership. Mm -hmm. So to be sanctioned by him as a leadership coach is great. And you're also trained in the Dave Ramsey system, which is financial, right? Dave Ramsey. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he, what is he, what is Dave Ramsey? Uh, what's his specifics about? His specifics are more about um, staying out of debt, managing yeah. your money, um, being, not frugal, but aware. Good, that's good. You know, I do love about you, your commitment um, to working with women in particular, you know, that's close to my heart too. I'm an original feminist, uh, but your clients, you focus on providing structure, organization, systems that when you implement them, make your life work seamlessly. So you're speaking my language. So thank you for being here with me today, Raksha. I so appreciate it. 
And uh, let's get into the conversation. So when we were talking about being in corporate America, you and I can relate considering I too came out of corporate and I learned so much, you know, <laughs> toward the end when I was in it, I was not happy. Uh, a lot of us who Thank left you. were not happy. But when I look back, I learned so much. You too? Yes, absolutely. Um, when I look back now, it's like, why didn't I get out sooner? Right. <laughs> right? Um, but it, it's a journey that we have to take. Yeah. And it teaches us so much. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to bring that out and share it with other women and empowering them to live their full life, mm -hmm. that's what really lights me up about what I do now. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like being in corporate? Because I bet you there's a, I'm, I'm again, from my own experience, I know that when we had um, people who were considered Indian, right? They look to you as the brilliant people, you know, the math, you're the smart ones. And yet I also saw anybody of color being passed over for uh, moving up for promotion. What was your experience? For me, it, would, it didn't set in until I was a couple of years into working. Like I loved what I did right from the get go. Um, it was something that I saw the difference I was making for the company's bottom line. I was able to train people and have an input in training people. And that's what I'm about. I'm about developing your talents and your skills to take it to the next level. And then I noticed a few times I submitted applications to be promoted and I didn't get promoted. And then I started asking, like the, after the third time, I started asking, why? What was missing? If I'm so great and you give me all these awards, why are you not giving me that promotion? And it was the language that was used. It was never about because you're of color or you're a woman. Um, it was always about you're just this much away from what you need to do. And that was like in every realm, right? Just this much. And in the beginning, I was a novice. Like I said, I worked because that's what I wanted to do. I, it wasn't like, I honestly didn't start working thinking, oh, I'm going to be a leader. Right. It was while I was working, I realized all the different things that I was bringing. And when these opportunities showed up and my coworkers would say, why are you not applying for that position? It was like, I can't, I've got kids at home. I can't do the commitment. But once the kids were at an age where they could do what they needed to do, that's when I started asking why, why? And there was never that clear cut because you're colored. Right. Well, they could never this, say that. They can't say that. They can't say that. And plus, I honestly, I'm a dreamer. By character, I'm a dreamer. And I want to see the good in everyone. Right. So I never perceived that somebody could discriminate just because of my color, but yet value what I brought to the table. Mm, that right there discriminate because of your color yet value what you brought to the table. Exactly. Yeah. So then I started asking questions and a few times I was told, you know, you need to let other people shine. It's not a, a, all about the glory. It doesn't have to come to you. It's people you develop. And it's like, okay, I was gullible. I believe that. I took it in. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, I get to build other people, but other people were building and they were bypassing, you know, and it was like, okay, when is it going to be my turn? And it was, it was then that I started really looking and said, pushing myself, pushing myself um, to be good at work. But then I also started building businesses outside of work and seeing the value that I brought. But that discrimination, it really doesn't end. Mm. 
even when you go to banks and stuff for financing, first I used to think, oh, it's because I'm a woman, they don't trust me with their money. But it's really not. And the way I found that out was I had a colleague of mine who was applying for a loan. And as a joke, she goes, why don't we experiment and see what happens? Same stuff. Same application. Same information. Everything. To the same bank. The only difference was the names. They accepted her. They declined me. Oh, wow. Wow. And when was this? How long uh, ago was that, Rasha? This was like 10 years back. Wow. It's amazing that you're still experiencing within 10 years. People go, oh, racism so old. It doesn't affect anymore. But 10 years is not a very long time. No. And racism is um, so subtle. Right? Especially like what happened in the summer was blatant, you know, but what happens every day in our lives is very subtle. It's built into the culture. And in some cases, people that are sitting on the other side of the table don't even themselves don't realize that it's built into the culture. So for me, it was a question of, I, I can't do this anymore. I just had to quit. Unfortunately, my daughter had a grandbaby and it was my escape to say, oh, I'm leaving. Yeah. But um, it it's everywhere, Trish. And yeah. it's sad because it it's, I really started looking at it because I myself am not like that. I don't see your color, I see you. So I got to this point of why, and on it boils down to the unknown, fear of the unknown. That that you were passed over because they they don't know what. Well, besides, I don't. Look, I wouldn't look good in a boardroom that was predominantly Caucasian. Yeah, yeah, right. It's a man's world. I mean, you and I've had conversations about oh, yeah. the glass ceiling. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons why I was so adamant. And I am so adamant even now to empower women um, to become successful on their own rights. Because think about it. It's we have so many responsibilities, especially in the modern world. You know, bringing up our kids, our families, sometimes being the single parent. Mm -hmm. There has to be equality in every way. Discrimination doesn't help. Yeah, no. So it's like, how do you break that? You know, you want to break the glass ceiling. You want to break discrimination. What's the root? For me, it's having conversations like with people like yourself. Yeah, me too. To say it just comes from fear. And once you, I'm not even saying do anything about your fear. I'm saying just acknowledge that there is fear because that's half the bell one well and you know the challenge is that you know we're i have to speak from myself and people i know who are white is we don't know that it's fear we don't get that it's fear and i told this story in the past when i worked in corporate i was responsible for promoting people out of a sales job or a service job into a supervisory position. And there was a woman that was passed over over and over and over again. It wasn't my final decision, but the reasons for her being passed over were always so silly. Like, you know, um, you, you did this this day. You did, and she, she sat me down and she, I, she said, Trish, you don't get it. She said, the last three people that you promoted you know, you told me these insignificant things that I did. They do the same insignificant things. Absolutely. I could not see it. And I- It's the blind spot. Correct. And I had to be willing to go with blind faith and say, okay, I'm going to live my life as, as if Anna, what she told me is correct. That I don't have the ability to see that I have a deep-seated racism that I didn't know was there. 
yes. to start looking at things differently. And I never would have labeled it fear. I never, I wouldn't have known what to label it if she didn't have the guts to speak to me and tell me this is what happens in my life as a black woman. And that's the conversation to be right. had. It's, it wasn't until my friend pointed out to me what was happening, but even me, that it, that was the person it was happening to, mm-hmm. I couldn't see it. Yeah. And her thing was always, you're so much better than this. You've got so much more that you can give to people. And it was like her opening my eyes that it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I've just been looking it over as I needed to grow. I needed to grow. I needed to grow. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't that. No, it wasn't that. And you weren't going to grow anymore until you were able to be put in a position where you could grow. Well, that was it. And then it was also the people that you had helped to, or the people that you had helped develop the skills to grow, you start noticing that when they've surpassed you, they try to keep you down. Oh, yeah. 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 But yet they use the tools that you provide. Yeah, yeah. And again, Raksha, I think you're right. I think that, you know, it's just, it's a total blind spot for so many of us. So this conversation hopefully is pointing out that there is a blind spot. And when you have one, sometimes even when it's pointed out, you're unable to see it. So it's a matter of being able to be willing to look at things a different way, even if it's not what you think. Just look a different way. Absolutely. And my my thing is, if somebody is telling you that you're not seeing things for what they are, don't brush them off. Listen to even, even if you listen just to 10% of what they're saying and really sit with yourself and say, really? Yeah. You'll discover so many different things that are happening. And trust me, that person that's pointing out to you, they don't have anything, any malice behind it. Right. They just want you to know what they're feeling. And the only way we can tell you that is by saying, hey, this is my perception. Mm -hmm. You know, my perception becomes my reality. I want you to just look at it from my angle. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, especially about corporate, because, um, we see it there all the time, but it's it's not so obvious. You well, know, it's not so obvious. But the other thing, Trish, is also I'm seeing a big um, big movement in women becoming entrepreneurs, and this is something that they need to really look at because they need to ask themselves: Are they bringing that to their business? Yes. Because the whole reason we want to become independent and we want to have our own businesses and stuff is so that we can erase that line of discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. And just keep knocking at that ceiling, you know? (laughs) Hey. Knocking at it. You know, we have the double thing. It's like, you know, you are a woman and you're a woman of color. So you put those things together and it creates a third thing that gets in your way. So this is my, this is a joke I used to have when I was in corporate, when somebody was uh, hiring someone and when they told me that I didn't get, I got passed on for the position, I would jokingly say, you know, you just surpassed me. You could have had the color equation taken care of, the female e- equation taken care of, and the age equation taken care of. I would have met three quotas for you. <laughs> Would have been perfect. Yeah, right. Quota, quota. Yeah, check, 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 check. Exactly. You have to laugh at it, right? You do. You do. You know, the other thing that was really interesting about your background was the whole Uganda situation. And I, I, uh, having lived as long as I have now, I can see how history is, um, how history repeats itself. As much as we don't want it to, I see that it does. Case in point you know, last week, uh, yeah. Capitol building. And when you were a child and you moved from Uganda to London in the late sixties, and then Idi Amin was like three years later, right? So there were 
hundreds of thousands of what let's call them refugees, people who were leaving Uganda. Many of them stayed within Africa, but many of them left and went to England. They went to the United States. It, it makes me recall the refugees that we're getting here. And, you know, we hear about refugee cities and, you know, that we're not allowed to take them in. What, if any, experience did you have, or do you remember, because you were young, when you were a child, was there any overt racism because of the refugee situation when you were young? In England, yes. Initially, there was a lot of, um, well, first thing is, the British were not used to having colored people around. Yes, yes. Right? Not, it, not in the amount of the influx that it created. And then the question was always about, well, why did you have to come here? And I remember our neighbors talking and um, like I spoke English, my mother didn't. So I was the person that interpreted everything. And the lady asked the question, you know, you could have gone anywhere in the world. Why did you come here? And I asked my mom that question and she goes, because we had family already here, it settling down would have been easier. Yeah. And um, then she goes, well, since you're here, why are you still wearing these clothes and why you're not adapting our stuff? And I didn't even ask my mom the question. I just looked at her and I said, because this is what we're used to wearing. Oh. You know, um, and that's really when it started, when I started this whole thing in me started building up at a very young age, because in school, it was, my food was different than the other kids. So it was like, not curiosity, oh, what are you eating? But you know how, how cruel kids can be. Yes. Right? Yes. So there was that. Then there was the whole thing about you smell. And it's like, but you smell to me too, because I don't like boiled cabbage. <laughs> right? So I've always been a rebel. And I've kind of... Um, you know, when you get that hard skin, yes. you develop a hard skin and you don't let people penetrate that. Yes. So now that I am where I am at the stage of life where I am, I'm doing a lot of self-discovery and I'm realizing that I have my own prejudices too. I don't like people telling me how I am. Just because you don't want to understand you expect us to understand, but you don't want to understand yourself. Mm. It's a two-way street. Yes. Right? And it was always like racism in London, very, you can see it. You can see it walking down the streets. And it all comes from insecurities. And these are not even smart people. These are dumb people, really. I look at them and it's like, guys, can you read? Just a simple question, do you know how to read? I get really wound up when, when I see discrimination at that level. Mm -hmm. So even last week when this was happening, it brought up feelings I wasn't even aware I had. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I almost felt like if I had a mic or a megaphone, I would tell them, can you guys just calm down and speak like proper human beings as opposed to somebody telling you do this and like a blind, blind person, you're just following them. When somebody wants you to follow them, ask them why they want you to follow them. Yes, yes. Because it's not always good. No, and that's, that's the whole thing about immigration and people coming here as well. I love how you pointed out the whole you smell thing. I mean, that's the reality of it for someone who's coming into the U.S. who's different. People are, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're eight years old or 80 years old. The difference might be if you're eight, you're going to say it out loud. If you're 80, you're not. 
but we're all, you know, people who have been socialized as white and this is my country, why are you coming here? Why did you have to choose this place? Why didn't you go where there are people like you? Well, well, unfortunately, my answer to that was the British decided to rule the world. Right. Now they gave us access to the world. Yeah, you were a commonwealth, right? Yes. Yeah, so you so we, integrate. they gave us the choice yeah. to go. Yeah, it's such an and interesting it, thing. I mean, from and unfortunately, my perspective, as a, as a young girl, as a young girl for you to have to deal with just all of the stuff that you have to deal with as a kid. On top of that, you have to deal with the people around you treating you so differently and not nicely. You know, it was, and how that, you know, you still hold on to those things no matter what. I mean, you overcome them, and it, but they, they're still with you to this day. Oh, and you look around, you probably still see it. I do, I do, and it makes me sad. You know, like what happened last Wednesday? Yes. I'm seeing it. I'm getting worked up and stuff. And I was speaking to an uncle of mine who's much older, who lived the Idi Amin thing. And he just kind of shook his head and he goes, you know what? I can't do this again. Mm. So in his mind, he's already created that he's going to have to deal with this. Yeah. And it was like, you don't have to deal with it. You've got other people that can hold you. But just those words to come out of his mouth to say, I can't do this again. Because think about it, when we left, or not when I left, but when my father left Uganda, when my uncles and aunts left Uganda, they were literally one suitcase. They were not, a, they were not allowed to take any of their assets. And these were well-to-do people. Right. And then to come into a strange place, rebuild yourself, have the discrimination of the people having this the common mass people who didn't understand why what was happening was happening, having the feeling of you're there to take their jobs when you're not right. really. Right. And you'll, you'll find a lot of the Asian based people, whether it's Chinese or Indians, Pakistanis, any of them, a lot of us have our own businesses. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we have that is because we don't want to rely on the state. Yeah. You know, you, you know, as you're talking about the events of last week, and depending on when you're watching this, we're talking about uh, January 6th at the Capitol building in the US. And, you know, for me, I grew up here, you know, and for most of us, we're looking at it as, as you know, some insurgents taking over. But for those who come from places like Uganda, Cuba, right, Somalia, those, for them, it's a whole different experience because your uncle went down the road of, oh, here I go again. I have to pack a bag and leave and find somewhere else to take myself and my family. So it's a whole different experience. And it's your, this conversation has raised that level of awareness for me that it never even occurred to me until we had this conversation. So thank you for that, Raksha. Mm. Thank you for sharing everything that you've experienced and I know that's not even close to everything but what you've experienced and given me another blinder to to know that I have blinder I don't think I didn't think about anyone else who had experienced what your family had experienced and start looking you know taking off the rose colored glasses right and seeing yeah. a different lens and that's what you do for us as you share a way for us to look through a different lens. So oh, thank really, you. I appreciate you very much for being here. Thank anything? you, thank you, thank you, my friend. Oh, my pleasure. Is there anything you'd like to leave people with before we go today? Just have an open heart. Really listen. And if there is any doubt, 
ask the question. There is probably somebody be around you that can answer that question. Mm. And with what's happening, honestly, it's not the it's not the generation that is in the workforce right now, but it's the retired generation that has seen this happen in so many countries that it brings fear to. Yeah. And there's a lot to learn from that generation of how they managed. Yes, absolutely. So talk to your grandparents. <laughs> absolutely. There's so much wealth there. Yes. It's unbelievable. There is so much um, encouragement, power, pride that your grandparents can give you, or even your parents. In some cases, you know, you may have older parents and you're in that area of what now? There's a lot of pressure right now with the pandemic and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The key is to talk with each other. And to really realize that your family is the most important thing. Yes. yes. Color surpasses everything. Yes, yes, yes. Raksha Joshi, thank you so much for being with thank us today. You. Thank, thank you. all of you for being a part of this conversation and for continuing the conversation in your circles, with your friends, with your family, and especially learning from those who came before you as to you know, how the world is, how the world was, and what we can learn from it. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you, Raksha. Thank you. Have a thank fantastic you, thank you. rest of your day, everyone.